So the first we would look at is viral croup. Now croup is an infection of the larynx, the trachea, and the bron and bronchi. It's usually viral. And um, the commonest is from parainfluenza viruses. But you can also have other viruses like respiratory syncytial viruses and influenza virus. And usually you have mucosal inflammation. So um, epidemiologically, there is a swelling, there is a critical narrowing of the trachea. And it usually occurs in children from six months to six years of age. But the peak is usually around the second year of life. And it's common in the wet season. So in, in a um, setting, you'd see it more in the rainy season. And like I said, backing cough, stridor, hoarseness of voice. And then usually they'll have this fever and coriza, like running nose, cough, small, small, worse at night, and then it's moves to this very bad cough and hoarseness at night of voice. So usually croup is viral, so you don't really need to be in hospital. However, if you are admitting, then it means that the illness is very severe or there's no easy access to hospital or the child is very young, less than 12 months of age, or you're not sure about how the parents will handle the situation. And um, sometimes people use moist air, uh, inhale moist hair. It doesn't really help. But what has been known to help is steroids. So either you give oral dexamethasone or prednisolone, and then you also nebulize with a steroid. And um, typically, budesonide is what we have in Ghana. It goes by the trade name of Fumicot. So you can um, use that for the nebulization. Some children have very bad. Um, Group, such that their oxygen saturation is less than 93. Once it's less than 93, you have to give them oxygen. And sometimes it's so bad that you need to intubate them and put them on a ventilator. Okay, so bacterial trachitis, that is um, bacterial infection of the trachea. This is also dangerous, but it's rare. And it's typically caused by bacteria, either staph or H. influenzae. So being similar to croup means that they have the stridor, they have the backing cough, and they have the hoarseness of voice. The exception here is that they have a very high temperature and they are toxic. If we see a child is toxic, the child really looks sick, okay? And then they have thick um, secretions coming out from the airway. Sometimes it might be so bad that you may need to give IV antibiotics and intubate them and put them on a ventilator. Okay, so acute epiglottitis. This is also another life-threatening um, lower respiratory tract infection, typically caused by H influenza type B. And what happens is that there's intense swelling of the epiglottis. Please go back and revise your anatomy and see where the epiglottis is. The epiglottis is a flap of skin that covers the trachea during talking and um, when eating and swallowing so that the food doesn't get into the trachea and gets into the lungs. It's usually, epiglottitis usually occurs one to six years of age. And it is important to distinguish between epiglottitis and croup because the treatment is different. From the etiology, you realize that epiglottitis is um, due to bacteria, H. influenzae, staph, croup is mainly viral. The difference is that in epiglottitis, the children are very sick and the, the throat is very, very painful. The child is unable to speak or swallow. You have drooling, constant drooling of saliva, and then they have a stridor. And you realize that it seems like their respiratory distress is getting worse as time goes by. And because of this, a lot of people will sit with their mouth open, trying to optimize the airway, trying to open up the airway because their airway is swollen. It's edematous from the inflammation. So they are opening their mouth in an attempt to try and increase the 
air. So this is typically how they sit. So in this child who has very bad epiglottitis, you don't need to examine the tools because once you put a spatula there, the inflammation worsens and then it can actually close up the airway. So when you are going to examine, you need to make sure that you have an ENT surgeon or an anesthetist there so that in case the airway closes, they will quickly intubate and put on a ventilator. So management, definitely you would intubate. Sometimes you can do a tracheostomy. Um, are you doing ENT? Not yet. No. Oh, are we doing ENT? Not yet. We haven't no. started ENT. Not yet. Oh, okay. When you do ENT, you understand tracheostomy. I don't want to go there. <laughs> and then usually you give them antibiotics. Usually they recover within two to three days. Okay, bronchitis. Bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchi and it's usually from mycoplasma or bodytella pertussis. That is whooping cough. So I'll use whooping cough as a prototype. Um, so with whooping cough, nowadays because of immunization is not very common. A child who typically has whooping cough they have um, three phases. You have the cataral phase where the child has runny nose, um, cough, like a cold-like presentation. Then they come up with a cough, which ends in a whoop. Then we have the convalescent stage where they are recovering. Sometimes the cough can be so bad that the child can become blue whilst they are coughing. So in a, uh, with our skin tone, the child will become black or the mouth becomes very black. And that is a sign that there's severe sinusitis. In infants, the hoop may be absent. So the hoop is like they cough, 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 and then they have the <gasps> But in infants, that hoop may be absent. Usually what you see in infants is apnea. So they'll, they'll cough, 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 and then they stop breathing. And then they start breathing again. And you can also have epistaxis that is bleeding from the nose after vigorous coughing. Some can also have subconjunctival hemorrhages that is bleeding into the conjunctiva of the eye from the vigorous coughing. It's all from the fact that there's so much force used in coughing that it ruptures tiny, tiny blood vessels either in the nose or in the eye. So a child with very bad whooping cough can present with what we call raccoon eyes. The eyes are so red and bloodshot, like there's some trauma, but there hasn't been any trauma. And this can go on for three to six weeks before the convalescent phase comes in. That's when they are recovering. Some of the complications of pertussis, you can have pneumonia, they can have convulsion, and they can have bronchiectasis. But these are quite uncommon. The commonest that you find is the apnea. So management really, let's talk about um, investigation. Characteristically, for whooping cough, you, you realize that it's caused by Bodytella pertussis, which is a bacteria. But interestingly, when you do the WBC, you realize there's a marked lymphocytosis. And it is treated with erythromycin, which is a macrolide. And usually, um, contacts would also start coughing they will pre present with a similar cough. So these contacts, parent, sibling, school contacts. But these days, because of vaccination, it's not common. When you realize that the child has whooping cough and you are sure, you need to give all the close contact erythromycin prophylaxis. And um, like I said, immunization has reduced the risk. Um, but however, as a child grows, the level of protection decreases. So if along that line, the child develops immunosuppression, they can be prone to um, an infection, bronchiolitis. So this is the last 
um, section. So bronchiolitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. You know that the airway, you have the trachea, then you get the bronchi, and then you have the bronchioles because before you get to the alveoli. So the bronchiolitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. Bronchiolitis is very common in infancy. So when I say infancy, I'm talking about children below one year of age. And it usually occurs in the rainy season or in the winter in um, the temperate zones. And about two to three percent of children who have bronchiolitis will have to be admitted. Even though it occurs in infancy, the commonest age is between one to nine months of age. So it's very rare in older children above one year. Commonest organism causing it is um, respiratory syncytial virus, that is RSV, but you can also have human metanumovirus and other viruses. Coronavirus can also cause bronchiolitis. <laughs> so the clinical features, they would usually have this chorizal symptoms, like they'll have some cough, and dry cough, the cold, and they'll have difficulty breathing. Then you also have um, wheezing. That is a musical sound that you hear, but it's not always present. Um, because of the discomfort of the difficulty breathing, there will also be feeding difficulties, especially for children who have a cold and their nose is blocked and they are breastfeeding as well. So you realize that a child who will typically when you breastfeed, they feed well. Now they are not doing that and they are crying more. They can also have apnea. Children who have um, who are born premature can develop um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a complication of um, um, the prematurity. So on examination, you would You'd have tachypnea, which is fast respiratory rate. Then there'll be subcostal and intercostal recession. Then the chest will be hyperinflated. And then they also have a prominent stem. And you'd realize that because the chest is pushed out um, and the, the diaphragm is flat, it pushes the liver down. So the liver is also displaced. And when you listen with a stethoscope, you hear fine crackles. And then you can also hear wheezes. And checking the heart rate too, you have tachycardia, that's increased heart rate. And then they can have cyanosis or pallor. So this is just a summary of the clinical findings. You see that the liver is pushed down. Um, there, there can be apnea, sharp dry cough, cyanosis or pallor, hyperinflation of the chest. So um, in advanced countries, they will do nasopharyngeal secretions to, um, as part of the investigation. If you do a chest x-ray, you see that the chest will be hyperinflated, meaning that there'll be a lot of air trapping in the lungs. So you see that the lungs, the lung field look very, um, black. Then you will see that the diaphragm is almost flat. And if you do a blood gas analysis, you will see that there will be low oxygen and increased carbon dioxide. Uh -huh. So this is the x-ray. This is what I was talking about. If you look at the picture, the x-ray on my right, on my left, sorry, you'd see that the ribs are almost horizontal compared to the one on my right, which is a normal X-ray. Then if you look at the lung fields, you, you see that these lung fields look very, very black, meaning that there's a lot of air in them. On X-ray, air looks black. Okay, so there's a lot of air and compare how the diaphragm looks to the normal X-ray. You see that the, the normal X-ray, the diaphragm looks sort of semicircular or dome shape. But in the other, in this hyperinflated x-ray, the diaphragm is almost flat, okay? So anytime you see a chest x-ray looking this way, there's hyperinflation. And it means that there's more air going into the chest than necessary. You can also find the same picture in asthma, okay? So unfortunately, there is no, there's nothing 
um, curative. That's what I should say. The treatment is supportive. So you give oxygen if they need oxygen. Um, so you determine the concentration of the oxygen by using the pulse oximetry. So if you put the pulse oximetry on and the oxygen saturation is maybe 92, you give them oxygen, you keep increasing the oxygen until you get to like maybe 95 and above, then you know that you are okay. And you also need to be monitoring the infant for apnea. If you realize that the infant is not breathing well, then you need to um, increase the oxygen and you need to pay attention. If they stop breathing, you may need to um, amble back them or ventilate them so that they start breathing. Um, let's take note that here, actually nothing is helpful. It's just supportive treatment. Antibiotics are not helpful. Steroids are not helpful. Mist inhalation is also not helpful. Sometimes when you give bronchodilators, they help because a bronchodilator helps to open up the bronchioles so that um, the air will be able to leave. If the child is also breathing very fast, you want to give IV fluids because they are breathing fast, they are losing uh, fluid. You know that when you breathe out, the expired air contains um, water vapor. So when you breathe very fast, you're actually losing fluid that way. Sometimes if the child is not breathing well, you may need to put them on the ventilator. And respiratory synthesial virus is highly infectious. So you need to employ um, hygiene or hand hygiene practices, frequent washing of the hands to prevent infection of other patients in the hospital. It's similar to what we are doing with this COVID thing. So most of the children will recover, even though it's a very serious infection and it looks scary, they would recover usually within two weeks. And, but you realize that half of them will keep getting this cough and wheeze, cough and wheeze thing. And sometimes the infection can lead to a permanent damage of the lungs, what we call bronchiolitis obliterans. So this is a complication of bronchiolitis. Okay, so. You can prevent it by giving um, palivizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. It's given monthly, not available in our setting. It's only available in the West. And it's commonly given to preterm infants because they are mostly at risk of this. And it's very expensive. So, well, it's given monthly. So, you give several injections. Really difficult okay so if there are any questions i will be glad to answer them are there any questions any questions hey why is everybody so ask your questions. Where are you? <laughs> Yo, are madam. They? Yes. Uh, please, uh, how, would you, how would you differentiate between a uh, backing cough and a normal cough? You made mention of backing cough. Okay. How would you differentiate That's between this You have to hear it. <laughs> you have to hear it too. <laughs> I, well, do you know what? You can go to YouTube and then uh, look for it. But there are some things that when you hear in the clinical setting, you would never forget it. Yeah. Hey, madam, I want to ask, um, were there slower respiratory tract infections? Do they cause snoring? Pardon? I'm asking whether they cause snoring. They make someone snore. They can cause snoring, yes. Especially tonsillitis or um, very bad nasal congestion. Yes, you can snore. Okay. Adam, so um, how do you manage it in such case? So with the snoring, if you give nasal decongestants, it helps. And then um, antihistamines too, and sometimes steroids to decrease the inflammation. 
Because the snoring is because there's inflammation which is blocking the airway. And so it reduces the, the space that the air can go through. That's what causes the noise on breathing. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Madam. Yes. Madam, the lower uh, respiratory you were talking about, if let's say you manage it for two weeks and the child is still not recovering, uh, mm -hmm. do you still continue or what do you do? Because you as you say. said, there's nothing really, you said? Ah, you mean like the bronchiolitis? Bronchiolitis, yes. Okay, so yes, it depends. The if the child is not getting better, if the child is not getting better, then you have to refer. If the child is getting better, then you know that the treatment is supportive. So there isn't anything to do. Okay. 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 All right. Any I'm more questions? If a bone like this, then probably we can or any of this. I don't. I'm just prolonged bronchiolitis. Any bronchiolitis? Prolonged Yes. If if there is um, if it's very bad and the child is coughing so much, yes. Because um, what happens is that emphysema is just a, a situation where there's distraction of the alveoli. So when you have um, inflammation of the bronchioles. The bronchioles are at the, the alveoli are at the end of the bronchioles. So it can actually be a continuous infection. And that can affect the um, alveoli and can lead to emphysema. If it's very bad. Are you okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Uh, Madam? Yes. With the, uh, uh, with the earlier part, the upper respiratory infection, the otitis mm -hmm. media, if yes. it's caring in a child, what would you mm -hmm. advise uh, the parents to do? Let's say you've, you've seen a child, you've, it's been treated. And you realize that if you look through their history, it's been something that has been uh, recurring. What, what mm -hmm. is it something that they are doing that is making it happen? Or what, what would you suggest? Or what would yeah. you say to the parents? If or what would you ask more to find out? If it's recurring, if it's recurring, then it's possible that there's a risk factor. You see, either maybe the child is going to a preschool and so they keep getting exposed okay. and getting infection. Or either from poor food intake, there's malnutrition, or um, the child wasn't breastfed because breastfeeding also protects from otitis media. Okay. Um, or they might have a problem with their eustachian tube. So the eustachian tube is not functioning well. Sometimes too, there can be a history of thumb sucking or using pacifiers. And those things keep the eustachian tube mm -hmm. open. You realize that when you yawn, you feel it in your ear. It is the yeah. eustachian tube, that connection between your throat and your ear. So when you suck yeah. your thumb or you use the pacifier, you are constantly keeping this tube open such that if there's a throat infection, okay. it is easily transmitted to the ears. So you have to explore all these things and see what exactly they are being, they are doing that is predisposing the child. Um, if you can't find anything, you can refer to ENT. Um, unfortunately, a lot of children who are seen, who are sucking their thumb, it's too late to do anything about it. So the time to stop thumb sucking is when they are babies. It's past. Uh -huh. When they are babies and they start putting their hand in their mouth, that's when it should be stopped. Your mouth. When they are, they are grown children, they are maybe two years and they are now champion at it. You can't stop them. <laughs> they 
when they will stop is when they themselves decide that maybe because of peer decide pressure. Decide that they want to stop. Uh -huh. They will stop. Because that is a soothing mechanism. You realize that the okay. children who suck their tongue, they don't cry. And so the parents actually leave them to suck because it gives them some relief. <laughs> but on the <laughs> other <laughs> hand, it's also the mental. It's the same reason why parents like to give pacifiers to babies because it keeps them quiet. But it's actually not helpful. But okay. madam, what about the, if there's any physical thing maybe at the preschool that is maybe doing that, maybe you put something in their ears or something like yes. this? Uh -huh. So a foreign body, too, yes, a foreign body too could be there. So in that case, if you refer to ENT, for all you know, there might actually be something, maybe some crayon is in the ear. And because it's a foreign body, okay. it's causing the recurrence. So what I would say is that if it's not going, you can just let them see an ENT specialist. Okay. Uh, because yeah. I've had an encounter of a child having a pencil break in the ear and it's been there like mm -hmm. for almost two times. And they never realized mm -hmm. it, but then there was Nobody. a path forming around it. Uh -huh. Nobody saw it. She wasn't feeling any pain. She wasn't having yeah. any pain or anything. But later, a path was formed around it. So there was regular examination, and then it was found that the, the path was there. So when they took out the path, that was when they realized that there was a pencil broken in the ear. And it was, was like so close to, to the drum. To that. But I didn't yes. agree. No, 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 it didn't. So it was just lying there. So it was like so I mean, close to perfecting the drum. Hmm. As for preschool, that's why I always say that if you have any choice, just let the child be a little older. Because at least they can come and older. tell you that someone put a pencil in my ear. As for preschool, there. It's but, true. Hmm. But well, we don't have choices. We are working. So we hope that they take good care of our children for us. <laughs> Today. <laughs> well, um, so, um, uh, your second to last line, um, you may mention that the drug. Palivisuma. He said I may mention. Palivisuma. Pardon? I can't hear you. Maybe you should type it. You mentioned I mentioned what? Oh, okay, you did mention that the drug is not found. It's not common here. It's not common. No, it's not in Ghana. Word. I don't know if I'm correct. It's not in Ghana. So when we have such a this kind of situation, how, which one do you use in Ghana? Oh, so what I was saying, that medication is not, it's not to treat the, it's not to treat bronchiolitis, so it's prevention. It's a vaccine, right? I it remember you a, said it was a vaccine. An injection, an antibody injection. It's an antibody injection. It is not a, it's okay. not a, an antibody to the bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis really you don't do anything, it's supportive. If they need oxygen, you give oxygen. If they are losing fluid from the fast breathing, you give them IV fluids. You don't, there's no management. And then you can nebulize with um, salbutamol to open up or to dilate the bronchioles so that you ventilate better. All right, thank you. Mm, okay. Any other questions? Are we okay? Any other questions? Are we okay? So can I run away? Tomorrow, God willing, I will... Tomorrow, God willing, I'll teach you the ethics and pharmacology together. Okay. So today's ethics that we missed, I'll teach it in addition to pharmacology. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, 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 yeah